So that's all I'm trying to communicate here. Okay, so here's the general uh, design procedure. I mean, this, this applies to any, d any experiments, not just ones that you might do in the laboratory. Okay. So if you're going to go about doing experiments, the first thing you have to do is determine why you're going to do them. Like, you just don't go doing experiments without a reason. Okay. Um, and I can tell you, these type of, this type of thing, especially if you're talking about a plant, right? You want to do some um, experiments on an existing plant. Um, these have to be designed very carefully, you know, experiments you might do on a plant. Because if you're doing them on an existing plant, you're still making the product. And you still want to sell the product. You can't tell someone that's running a plant. So here's how plants work. You have two groups of people. You have lots of groups of people. But you have the engineers, right? And then you have the operations people. The operations people are often engineers too, but they run the plant. That's all they care about. Pounds. Pounds. <laughs> that's what you hear. Pounds. How much can we make a day? So anything that you might do that keeps them from making lots of pounds, they won't like you. Okay? So usually determining the objectives is something, if you're doing it in, in a plant, you have to plan with the operations people. And these, uh, these, li these limits here are limits they'll tell you what they are. They'll say you can't change that temperature more than this range because if you do, the polymer will go off spec and that's not going to be allowed. Okay? I actually saw a guy at ExxonMobil fired for doing this without talking to the operations people. Okay? Poor guy. Hope he's employed now. All right. Um, so once you decide what you want to do, like I want to learn about what's the most important factor, I want to build a regression model, then you select what the inputs are, right, which inputs you're going to manipulate, and how many levels you're going to use, two or three. Then you select the things you're going to measure, right. These are, these are th typically for the things we're doing are going to be measures of production and measures of product quality, okay. So you saw them for the polymer example. Okay, then you perform the experimental design. By that I mean, then you do what I'm going to explain to you next in the rest of the lecture. All, I, all I'm really covering from here on out is this part right here. Okay? Then you do the experiments. These experiments can take a long time. Okay? So I've been at plants where um, they're doing this kind of experimentation for reasons I won't explain. And so the engineers get to work 12-hour shifts seven days a week for like two months because they're running the plant full time to do these experiments to build a model let's say and so this is a huge investment you understand if you're going to build if you're going to pay have two engineers you understand if you pay an engineer a hundred thousand dollars it costs the company like three hundred thousand bucks do you know how that works insurance overhead and all this is expensive okay and so this is how it works in industry let's say you want to do this there's going to be two possibilities one is you were told to do it then you do it, right? The other possibility is you think you should do it. No one told you to, but you think you should. Then you have to go to the people that are in charge and tell them this is going to make more money than it's going to cost. They don't care otherwise, okay? You could say this will make the world a better place. And they'll say, how much money does the world being a better place uh, accrue? And you'll say nothing. They go, we could care less about the world being a better place, okay? <laughs> that, I mean, that's the reality. That's, 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 that's how corporations work. It's about, it's about making revenue. Okay. I mean, okay, you're not going to have ex plant explosions or, or pollute the environment. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm saying it's all about, it's all about making money. That's, you ever seen ExxonMobil's income each? They're the richest, com like, richest company in the world. Think they get to be the richest company in the world because they don't think about how they spend their money? <laughs> no, they, that's not how it works. Okay. So these type of experiments have to be planned very carefully. They take a long time. They take a huge amount of manpower. And so you have to have a good, very good reason for doing them. Once you've done the experiments, okay, then you have to check whether the experiments are any good. Okay. So by data consistency checks, these might be a variety of things. First thing you do is like look through the data visually and see if it looks like it makes sense. Like we increase the temperature, do we get more polymer? If not, something's wrong because that's what should happen. Sometimes you'll see weird things happen here. Okay. And then you'll say something weird happened here. Then you go to the operations people and go, what were you doing last, it's kind of like, a, like you're, you've arrested them, right? What were, you, what were you doing last Tuesday at 3 o'clock? Then they go into their log book, right? They keep a log of everything they do. They were out with the, we were out uh, doing some service on a valve on the distillation column. You're like, that's great. I was doing data collection on the distillation column. So, you know, that means throw that data set away. Because it, it has not the information you look for. 
It's got the information of the guy doing the service on the valve, not what you wanted. So my experience here is that if you do these type of experiments, even if you do them carefully, one quarter or one third of the data gets thrown away for various reasons. Just doesn't, just doesn't work, okay? All right, the other thing you can do with data consistency check is things, see if material and energy balance closes. Have you guys ever talked about that? So if you have a plant and you have a set of measurements, you should be able to write material and energy balances on the plant and see if, if they agree with each other. Like the same amount of material is going in, it's coming out, right? Same thing with energy. So you might do that kind of thing too. Okay, then you do what we've done in the, in the beginning of the class. You can do a bunch of analysis on the data. Okay, and this, this thing, this whole thing here, okay, well then I should say, right, you could, you could build models, you could do a hypothesis testing, you could do linear regression, you, you could do it all, okay? Um, and then once you get here, you might decide you made a mistake. Like it's very common at this point to either you lost data or you didn't do enough, you have to do some more. Like you get to the end and you're like, I don't have enough data to answer the question I want, I gotta go back and do a few more experiments. Okay. On the MATLAB homework you have, um, you're gonna go through most of these different steps. Because we built like a simulator, like we don't have a plant, but we built a simulator of this, one, this polymer reactor I'm showing you. So you can pretend to do experiments, pretend to do experimental design, all that. So I think it's about as good as we can do, um, given that we don't have <laughs> real equipment to run. Okay? So this is the general procedure, and what I'm really going to focus on is that part right there. How do you do the design? Okay. Full factorial design. So here is some basic, um, I probably shouldn't have, permutations or combinations, that's very confusing based on what we talked about at the beginning of class. What I mean is, well, here I'll show you. Let's say that you have a factor. Let's call each factor has an index i, okay? L is the number of factor levels for that particular factor. So in other words, for that input, that's the number of levels you can choose. It's either two or three, okay? Each input either has two or three levels. K is the number of inputs or factors that you have. N is the number of times you're gonna repeat each experiment, okay? So this is the total number of experiments, right? You take, so let's say you have just to make this easy, look at this one here. Let's say that you're not going to repeat any experiments, so n is 1, they all have the same number of levels. That means you're going to do L to the k power, okay? So, k is in it. So, in other words, if you have three inputs, right, that's, I mean, sorry, yeah, three inputs, that's k, and they each have two levels, you'll do eight experiments, right? Because there's eight different combinations that you can do. Does that make sense to you? Like, three inputs, low, 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 high, Low, high, 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 you know. <laughs> okay, sorry. Bo I'm boring myself at this point. <laughs> All right, so this is just giving you the number of experiments. So again, the notation here is that you have an input. Its index is i. You have k total number of these. Each of the inputs has this number of input levels, two or three it's always going to be. Okay, this is the number of time you're going to repeat each experiment. So this is the total number of experiments. You know, so it might be three times two times three times two, whatever it is. Um, and then multiply times the number of experiments. If you have no duplication, it means n is one, and they all have the same levels, either two or three, it's this number of experiments. And this table just gives you some idea of this grows quickly and, and um, explosively, right? So this is the number of factors that you have. This is if you do a two-level design, all the, all the inputs have two levels, high and low. If you do three level, you get this. And so, for example, for our polymer reactor with five inputs, if we do two levels, we do all possible combinations of the five inputs at two levels, there'll be 32 total experiments. If we do a three-level design, there'll be 243 experiments, okay? So I'm hoping that you'll get the idea that this is probably too many, to be honest. This is certainly too many. Because I can tell you, it takes two days to do an experiment at least, so, so you'll be doing this for like two years. That'll get you fired too, okay? Um, all right, because so you see, they're, they're probably gonna come to you and say, we need an answer in a month. We need an answer in a month or something like that. You don't get six months. So, so this is a bit of a problem, right? This, this kind of, I mean, this is how, at first glance, I would do it. If they said, I have two inputs and they can each be high or low, I'd say, I would just sample all corners of the cube, you know, and do all the experiments. And that's okay if you have a small number of inputs, right? You could do eight experiments or nine. But if, it, if you have a lot of inputs, a number of combinations grows too quickly and this isn't going to work out. All right? So this is <coughs> given you for a couple of reasons. So just to give you an example of what they look like. Now, 
when you, you can do all these calculations I'm doing within MATLAB, okay? And you will, because you'll do it on the homework. Because for any particular problem, it doesn't know what your inputs are. It's going to just, I think in MATLAB it might do 0 and 1, but for here, minus 1 means the low value for that input, plus 1 means the high value, 0 would mean the value in the middle, okay? So when you see x1 being minus 1, it doesn't mean x1 is minus 1, it means x1 is a, its low value, whatever you define that to be, okay? Plus 1 means x2 is at its high level, whatever you define that to be, okay? So if you do a, a full factorial design, okay, you have three inputs, each of them has two levels, minus 1 and plus 1, low and high, you're not going to repeat any of the experiments, n is 1, then those are the eight combinations. I mean, anybody could enumerate those, right? There they are, eight. Okay? All right. So, you might do different things to, um, to improve upon this. One sensible thing to do would be maybe repeat runs. You understand? So, in other words, if you do this experiment just once and it's a bad experiment, that's probably not good. Okay? Now, if you do enough experiments, one bad experiment won't kill you. But, you know, obviously if you could repeat all these experiments, it would be better than not. But it doubles the number of experiments, so it's not free. The other thing people do a lot is do something called add setter point. So in other words, do some experiments where everything is at its mean value. I shouldn't say mean. Nominal value, normal value. Okay? So, so the notation here is 1 is the lowest value, plus 1 is the highest value, and 0 is usually the normal value you run at. Like if you normally run the temperature at 300, this might be 275, 300, 325, something like that, okay? You do this because you could argue if, if I wanted to know anything about how the plant behaves and someone said, where would you most like to know how the plant behaves? I'd say where I normally operate it. <laughs> you know, it's pretty reasonable, okay? The other thing is that if you do multiple experiments at one point, you could do statistics at that one point and then just kind of assume they apply to any other point, right? So if someone said, how, if you do an experiment, how reproducible is your experiment? Then you could do five experiments like this, do statistics, and then just assume it applies across the board. Because you're not going to do every experiment five times. All right? Okay, well this is a little bit onerous, right? You know, you can see from the table I gave you here, this isn't going to scale well. In fact, it scales horribly. So we might consider doing something called fractional factorial design. And so the idea here is that you want to do some fract, I mean, just like I said, you want to do some fraction of the designs you would do with a full factorial design. You want to do half of them, a quarter of them, a third of them, a ninth of them, something like that. Okay? The idea behind this is it's not, it's not like you do a full factorial design and then just do the first half. That's, that's a bad idea. <laughs> right? Because if you came here and said, um, I'm just going to do the full, full design and then I'm going to pick the first half. Well, this one isn't as bad as I would hope. Yeah, it is bad. Right, if you said, here's the full design, I want to do half of them, I'll do the first four. X3 is always at its low level in the first four. So that's not a good choice, right? So my, the argument here is that if you're going to do eight experiments, and, sorry, let's look up here, four experiments instead of these eight, there's a particular four you should do. And it's, it's not the first four because those all have X3 at the lowest level. You won't learn anything about X3 if you do that, okay? So that's the idea, is how do you pick these things out, okay? So generally speaking, you want a design to have these characteristics. You want the th design to be balanced, okay? So this is all input level combinations have the same number of observations. What does that mean? That means if I decide, sorry to flip back here again, if I decide I'm going to do this experiment twice, then I should do them all twice. Okay. If you do that, it's a balanced design. This is not balanced here, right? Because I'm going to do this one three and those all one. So that's not actually balanced. Okay. But what actually is more important than that is this idea of the design being orthogonal. So it's easy to show in this table, but the words is this. The effect of any factor sums to zero across the effect of the other factors. People are like, what the hell does that mean? Okay, there's what it means. So let's say you've done a design like this. These, these, you've done these four experiments. What you notice is that x1 is at its low value twice and its high value twice. That means it's orthogonal, okay? Same thing with x2 and x3. So 
In other words, if you do a design where x2 is high three times and low one time the sum is not zero, that's not orthogonal. Okay? That means you visited one value too much compared to the other one. Biases the design, so it's not good. All right? So possibly like to be balanced, but certainly you like the design to be orthogonal. Okay? So the basic features, which I kind of already mentioned, this fractional factorial design is you use a, some fraction of the full factorial design. Okay? So I can just tell you, coming back to this here, that if you're going to do a two-level design, you're going to use half, a quarter, an eighth, or something like that. If you do a three-level design, you're going to use a third, a ninth, a twenty-seventh, something like that. It doesn't make any sense to do, you know, a third of the, a third of an eight. It's not even a whole number. <laughs> you got to do whole experiments, okay? Um, so these designs, you know, not including that idea of adding center points, which I showed you on the last slide, will be both balanced and orthogonal. These are going to be m mainly useful for determining the main effects. So if you go back to the regression model, this is going to yield, so in other words, you want to do less experiments. That's great. Here's what you get back, less information. And you get information now that if you went to this regression model back here, you're going to have enough information to determine is X1 most important, X2 most important, or X3. But you're not, and you might be able to get enough information to start figuring out some of these interactions, but probably not, okay? If you do a full factorial design, you could build this whole model here, so you understand? You have to decide how many experiments you're willing to do, and then you have to live with what information that'll provide. It's not free. You can't say, I want to do as little experiments as I can and do that. Well, there's a minimum number to do that, okay? And if you don't want to do that number, you have to abandon that idea. So a fractional factorial design, sorry, is going to be mainly useful for determining the main effects. Maybe you can do something about the interaction quadratic things that I talked about in that regression model, but not generally speaking. Okay? All right. So here's an example. Um, and this is a nice picture, I think. I got this from somewhere. I don't know where. Um, so we're doing a, let's say you want to do a one-half fractional factorial design. So here's a full factorial design. Same thing I showed you on the previous page, right? We have three inputs. They each have two levels, minus one and plus one. We're not going to repeat any experiments. Those are the eight experiments that we could do. <coughs> All right. So act if we want to do a one-half fractional factorial design, you can see that's going to be one-half. That's going to be four experiments. Okay. And so the idea of this particular picture here is there's two different combinations you could use. E either of them are equally good. You could either run the experiments that are the so you understand this cube is li living in three-dimensional space. Let me, and it shows you x2 goes this way, x1 this way, and x3. So it's like this value 1 here is all the things being low. x1, x2, and x3 all low. That one's them all being high. Okay? So it says if you want to do a fractional factorial design that has that property of being balanced and rotatable. I didn't, I didn't use the word rotatable yet, right? Sorry. You want it to be balanced and orthogonal. Then here's the two different choices. You could run the four experiments that are in the uh, open circles or the four experiments in the closed circles? So let me see, which one is which? So it looks like, um, eh, where's the minus one, minus one, minus one? Am I just not smart? I'm just not smart. Okay, that's, <laughs> that's one, okay? So in other words, the first group of ones here are the open circles. And the second group of four experiments are the closed circles. So, Either of these is good. Now, wh why are they good? Because, for example, if you look at the value of x1, you see that you do one experiment where, you do two experiments where it's low and two experiments are high. Same thing with x2 and x3, okay? And um, same thing down here, okay? So the, the point is, you don't just randomly pick off any four experiments you want. There's a particular way of picking out ones that have the property. So, I wouldn't expect you to be able to do that. Like obviously if I gave you some really complex thing with, you know, like a three level design with five factors, that would have like, what, 243 possibilities to start with, that'd be pretty cruel. <laughs> so I'd say enumerate those. No, I'm just kidding you. Um, so MATLAB will figure all this stuff out for you, right? You can go into MATLAB and for a problem of arbitrary size, they'll do the full factorial design, it'll do the fractional factorial designs for you. I'm just trying to give you a flavor for here that it matters which ones you pick. All right, um, and so this gives you an idea of what you can do with fractional factorial designs. It's not rocket science um, in terms of reducing the number of designs. So this is the number of inputs here. 
you know, three, four, five. I always highlight five because that's the polymer reactor example. Six, seven. Full factorial design with two factors gives you this number of experiments for two levels. And obviously, if you do a one half fact fractional factorial design, you'll get half of those. That's, that's the definition of what you mean by half. Take that number, divide by two, okay? If you want to do a quarter, you can do a quarter of the experiments. You might be able to do an eighth. Then you see these things that say NA. What does that mean? That means at this point you're not doing enough experiments to do anything useful on any level. Okay? So there you, the, you don't even do these. So if someone says I have, th I have um, three factors, I'd like to do a one quarter fractional factorial design, the answer is you could, but why would you? That'd be two experiments that yield no useful information. Okay? So you see the minimum number of experiments for each of these is kind of shown. If you get less than this, you start getting information that doesn't, is not useful. Okay, so like over here, if you have f the idea is if you have five factors, you can't learn anything from four experiments about five factors. Okay, so you don't. There's a limit to what you can do here. So if you have three levels, obviously this grows even worse. If you do a, f a full factorial design, and then you can see again, you could do a third of those, you could do a ninth of those, maybe a twenty seventh of those. If it gets to be too few to get any, infor any information, you see NA here. Okay. And so, for example, if you wanted to, let's say you had the polymer reactor example, right? Then you might reasonably say, I'm sure not going to do 243 experiments, but I might be willing to do 27. It depends, right? But see, the nice thing about experimental design is you can pick out what, how many experiments you want to do, and then you can conclude kind of ahead of time what you're going to be able to get out of the experiment before you do them. So, if somebody tells you, I need you to answer this question within a month and a half, you decide you can do 27 experiments, then you can go back to them and say, what do you hope to learn? And they're like, I hope to learn this. You go, you can't learn that from 27 experiments. I'm sorry. So it, it, it's, it's, right, it's nice to know that up front. You know, it's a trade-off behind how many experiments, what you're going to learn, but you don't, you know this up front. So it's not like you do the 27 experiments, analyze the data, and you go, oh crap, we can't find out quadratic effects. You know that going in, okay, so that's kind of nice. Okay, so here's an example. This is not all that exciting, but anyway, so this is for the polymer reactor, five inputs. If you do a full factorial design, if you have two levels, right, that's how I figured this out. I'm, the N is a number of inputs. Each input had two levels, I had five of them, so it's two of the five experiments, 32 possible combinations. Let's say I want to do a one quarter fractional factorial design, so I got eight experiments. Here's one reasonable set. It's not the only reasonable set. And again, if you look at each input, you'll see it visits its low value the same number of times as it visits its high value, so this is what we called orthogonal. Okay? And so again, these aren't picked out randomly. Okay? You can see that, right? Th these, are, these are, how did I, you might say, how did I get this in the first place? I went into MATLAB, <laughs> just like I do for everything. Went into MATLAB, did a one quarter fractional factorial design like you guys will learn how to do and, and just put the results here, okay? So you have to understand, I'm not trying to teach you how to come up with this design matrix, okay? I'm just trying to convince you the design matrix is important because it determines how many experiments you're gonna do and you're gonna get only a certain amount of information out of it, okay? And that this design matrix is easily generated once you decide what you want. So it's not, it's not generating these numbers that's hard, it's making sure that this design is going to give you the information you want. So I'm not expecting that you would come up with this. Because even I don't know how to come up with this, to be frank. Okay? All right. Is that the last slide? Almost. All right. So, so what we talked about. Full factorial design, that's like the most you could possibly do if you don't repeat. It's a little, for a small number of inputs, it's fine. Uh, as the inputs grow, it's, it's intractable, pretty much. And so you might consider doing um, fractional factorial designs, okay? So that's a next step. It yields a less information, but in a lot less experiments, so the trade-off might be fine. There's a set of <coughs> experimental design techniques called central composite designs that are specifically designed to do regression modeling, okay? So if somebody said, I want to build a regression model like we did yesterday, and I want to do this with the fewest number of experiments, I would tell someone, you should try a central composite design. 
there's, I can tell you in this experimental design world, there's, I don't know about hundreds, but there's dozens of different design techniques. So I'm just covering three classes, fa factorial, fractional, factorial, and these central composite designs. If you go into uh, MATLAB, you'll find it has other designs you've never heard of, box banking, all these kind of other techniques, okay? Um, and the reason I'm going to talk about this because it's very commonly used, probably the most commonly used other than the other two I've talked about, and it's actually what we use for the polymer example that I gave you yesterday. So I promised I would try to explain where that came from, and I'll do that now. Okay. So the way you do a uh, central composite design is you start with a full or fractional factorial design. So that's almost easiest to see here. So just look at this little picture, okay? So you see this, des what is this design right here? To me that says that's a full factorial design with a center point, right? You got two factors because it's, it's two dimensional. Low, high, low, high, so X1, X2. I've got all, all combinations which there's only four and I have a, have a point in the middle, right? <coughs> it's called a center point. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add that to something that looks like this, which I'll explain in a minute, okay? So I'm going to take this and superimpose, so this is another five experiments, okay? One's again done at the middle, and then the, you've got these four experiments done, as you can see in the picture down here, they're like over there, over there, over there, and over there, and I'm going to take these guys together and combine them. How many experiments is that going to be? Well, there's going to be two experiments there, and then there's going to be four and four. It's going to be ten total experiments. Okay? All right, you, s you might say, uh, what? <laughs> like, where does that come from? Okay. I, I, as usual, there is a bunch of statistics and math that underlies why this is a good choice and what you can get out of it, which we don't cover. Okay? But there is, this, it, there is a reasonable, there is a good reason you would want to do this kind of thing. So now going back up to here, okay? This is, again, this is either, a, in this case, it's a full factorial design. You can do the same thing with a fractional factorial design. I just showed you this picture because it gives you a kind of visualization of what's going on. So you could start with either full des factorial design like this one or fractional factorial design. These things here are called star points, okay? So now if you look at, like, let's say X1, which is this way, and X2, which is this way, you can see that X1 actually has, um, it's not so easy to see. It, you look at this, so let's say X1 goes this way and X2 goes this way. You can see now X2 actually has five different levels, right? It has that level, that level, that level, that level, and that level. It's actually five values now. You can see that, right? Same thing with X1. There's a value there, level there, level there, level. So now we've got, we took a problem that had in this case, add three levels, right? Because you had l low, medium, high, and added these points on. Depending on how we add them, as I'll talk about over here, you might get as many as five different levels now, okay? <coughs> and how you add these two together, you get three different types of designs, which I'll talk about over here, okay? So there is a general way to do this, and MATLAB will do it for you, but the reason you add these star points is because now you can, you have a better chance of estimating curvature, right? So if you have five different levels of an input, you're going to have a much better chance of knowing something about the curvature of that input. Okay. And the idea here is that typically the star points, of which here there's four, you add twice as many star points as factors. In this case, there's four because there's two factors. If you had 10 inputs, you'd have 20 of these star points. The point is that scaling is good. You know, twice, it's like you take the number of inputs and multiply by two, that's a lot better than like scaling like that, right? That's disastrous scaling. So you, it does introduce new experiments, but not as many as like a factorial design or something like that. And as you can see in this picture, if this blue box was your domain that you felt comfortable operating in, you've now gone outside that domain by adding these star points, at least for this case, right? That's what this means, can be new extreme values. You may or may not like that, it just depends. All right, so that's what this was. Two level design with a center point, four star points, which is twice as many as number of factors. Add them together, you get ten, those 10 experiments. I'll show you what this looks like in a minute or something like that. There's three different ways to do this. <coughs> what I showed you here was this thing here. This is a central, uh, this is a circumscribed central composite design. Okay, that's where the CCC, 
okay? Circumscribed central composite, triple C, okay? That's this, that's, all I'm doing is representing the same thing here up here. This is a different picture from a different website, so it doesn't have the center point, but it's the same thing. It's meant to be the same thing, okay? So now, right, you have five levels of each input. You have new extreme values. In other words, these red values are outside the blue box you established at the beginning, and that might not be good. Because if you thought this was the lowest you could go, you wouldn't want to go lower. So you might have to redefine the blue box so the red points are in the domain you want, for example. And then this has a property that is, in, in the design world, you'd also like a design to be rotatable. What does rotatable mean? Well, ge geometrically it means if you take this thing and rotate it around, it looks the same. Obviously, it's a circle. <laughs> Nothing's more rotatable than a circle or a sphere, okay? or hypersphere for that matter. But so you, you know, rotate this around. So that kind of design is called rotatable. That's good because it, has, it gives the design certain statistical properties that are desirable. I won't talk about what they are, okay? So that's called a circumscribed central composite design. This is, um, yeah, trying to figure out what's, <laughs> Maybe I'm not seeing straight. Oh, it's slightly different. Sometimes I have to get up closer here. Oh, okay. So this design is the same as this design saying what I said a moment ago. So it looks pretty much the same, but now you're ensuring that the, the red points are within the domain of interest, right? So for example, if you do a design, you might find for this design, this is minus one, this thing over here might be like minus 1.5, even though it doesn't look like it, and plus 1.5. Maybe you don't like that, so you could do this inscribed, so central composite design inscribed. Anyway, I'd rather call it inscribed central composite design, but it looks like this, and now you ensure that the, the red points are within the domain, right? So now this might be like 1.70, that'd be, sorry, minus one, Minus 0.7, 0, plus 0.7, and 1. So it looks just like this one, except you've just squeezed it in to make sure all the points are between minus 1 and 1, okay? So in other words, if you were worried about those things being outside the domain, you could just do this design right here, and they'll be within, okay? MATLAB will do that. And then the one that's actually in the thing we did yesterday is this face-centered design here. That's this right here, okay? So what you're doing here is you're, you still have these star points, but they're actually in on the cube. You see these are extend outside the cube. If you do a face-centered design, then those things actually are on the edge right there, 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 and there. That kind of design is called face-centered, okay? And if you do a face-centered design, hopefully you can see this is not rotatable, because if I start rotating this thing, it doesn't look the same. By not rotatable, I don't mean you can't rotate it. I mean, when you do rotate it, it looks different, right? If I rotate this, it looks the same no matter how much I rotate it, but not the same here, obviously. Yeah? So would you use this, uh, the circumscribed model if you're like looking for uh, some extreme factor values? Is that the only reason you use that instead of like the face-centered? Well, the yeah, I mean, generally speaking, the, the difference between this one and this one is simply that this design is, th is essentially the same as this design except you've maintained all the values between zero and one. I mean minus one and plus one. You're asking me though, what's the difference between like this design and this design? Oh no, I'm sorry, the face centered and the circumscribed. I was just wondering why like, see how on the top one got two star points that are outside of the domain on the top yep. left and the yep. right? So, yep. so would you just, why would you use that one as opposed to the face centered one? Like just if you're looking for critical value? Well, I mean...